January 18th, 2021. Do I have the wrong minutes open? It says December 21st, 2020 on the front. That's the agenda, yes. That's got the wrong agenda written on it, yeah. Okay. That's got the right agenda. It's got the wrong date, I think. Yep. Anyway. Uh, it, it is January 18th. It is uh, 5.04 p.m. The Board of Commissioners of the Hardwick Electric Department is meeting. All commissioners are present, as is Mike Sullivan, Jessica Patterson, and Sean Enterline. Uh, is there a motion to approve or to modify the agenda? I just noticed that we had just when we last met with the select board, we talked about meeting in in February. So Mike will is going to a meeting of select board Thursday night and he can find out if they want to meet with us again in February. Uh, so you okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that if was we, an agenda issue that but that's okay. That's but, that's fine. That I guess that, that would have been new that would have been new business. I guess that's new business. Anyway, okay. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I was going to uh, say the uh, executive session um, issue, is that the same issue that... Uh, well, fine. we'll discuss the executive session issue when we get into executive session. Right, but it's part of the agenda. So I want to make sure that, I mean, can I bring up a, 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 an if, additional... If, if, if we need to go into executive session for something else, you can make an, a motion at that time, but let why don't you wait and see what the discussion is? Oh, okay, and, okay, that, that sounds good. I'm not going to discuss what the executive session. No, I, is about I realize that. Yeah, I, I got it. I got it. Okay, so the other. Uh, so I guess the agenda yeah. is okay. Well, and actually, no, yeah, and it was really timely. The VIPSA report about. Um, uh, storage, because I was going to bring that up as uh, an agenda item, but it uh, looks like Sean's going to be, be discussing that. Great. Okay. Uh, is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Any objection? Hearing none, the agenda is approved. And we have the minutes from our last meeting attached. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Uh, I, so minutes. Yeah. I have a question. Um, we weren't in executive session the whole meeting. <coughs> Basically, it seems no to minutes. be something missing from yeah, the minutes. Page, page, two like page, is, page two is missing. Page two is missing. <laughs> so I don't think we can approve the minutes. There's nothing uh, there. Okay, so if um, if we could have the minutes, the full minutes attached next time, um, but I would ask that that uh, Jessica that or Mike whoever posts them uh, onto the website post them as draft minutes, uh, so that we get them up on the website, but um, and do that punctually. But um, I don't think there's any. I don't think we can approve the minutes the way they they are. We have. Yeah, good. I, I think that's important that we get them out there onto the website as quickly as we can as draft is a way to do it. So that's great. With page two. So yeah, complete. Yes. Okay, uh, which takes us to the next agenda item, uh, which is public comment and discussion. But since there isn't anyone here from the public, I think we will skip that which takes us to jess okay sorry about that i was running up and down the stairs for a second okay <laughs> so there was a um another big jump again let's see let me get to the right page Um, so where, where we had gone down in November when we started getting all the COVID money, the VCAP, um, but then once that ended, then 
Um, we did start going back up. But if you look at the 90 days, we're back up another 30,000 on that. So. But the variance against last year is, is only 14,000. Right, right. So it's not, you know, if we're looking at just what's happening this year, but, you know, over last year, it's not, it's not a huge, huge variance. So. <clears throat> Do, do we know how much of this is is people who were late last year and how much of it is is new people, new customers? Uh, no, we don't, it doesn't specify it out that much. Yeah. It just gives the, the lump sum of, of the customers. It's a print out of a, it's like a 350 page document, so. Okay. Yep. Um, <clears throat> Does anybody have any questions? I know no. I can hear Mike saying something. Mike's muted. Is that better? Mm -hmm. I was just going to say so, yeah, but you can definitely see the, the incline of 90 day arrearages in 18, 2018 was 81. Uh, 19 was 140 and this year was 289. So it is still lingering for sure. Have people responded to the pay over time uh, option? Uh, well, actually, we haven't had, um, I mean, we're making arrangements, but it seems to be more of just short term arrangements. I'm not seeing a lot of long term arrangements. Uh, we do have a lot of people that have that have forked out quite a bit of money to get themselves caught up with this. Yeah. Uh, we did create a new um, delinquent notice that we send out now. It's not a disconnect notice. We've we've changed our delinquent disconnect notice to say delinquent, so that we can send it out. And it mentions nothing about disconnect, no dates, no fees, no nothing. It's just uh, so we can still send out a, a monthly notice to the customers just keeping them up to date on what their delinquent amount is that way we don't violate all the disconnect procedural rules that we have to follow if it says disconnect on it mm -hmm. that's that's a good approach no because i know that we have a lot of the habitual customers who say well i don't pay until i get the red one so we weren't sending out the red one before now we are so that, that everybody they can't say that they weren't notified about it so yeah we did we have had customers shelling out some serious cash to get themselves caught back up so huh. but right now we can't disconnect anyone anyway under the right. under the pc rules right. um, that's, and, correct. And that's for the foreseeable future so after having had that long discussion at our last meeting about what we might do, um, events overtook us. Mike, you were reading out some numbers and I didn't see, were you reading number or customer counts or were you? Yeah, right at the bottom of the, right at the very bottom of the first page, the last block of December there, for each year, there's a total customer count and the arrearages in the 90 day pocket seem to have the most disparity year to year compared to the 30, 60, 90. Oh, okay. Yes. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes. Yes. No, I see what you're saying. I and I think saying. the 90 day indicator is the one I watch the most. So those are the people who are really having trouble paying. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because otherwise it hasn't changed very much at all. Exactly. Um, if you compare the 90 day to October instead of November, it actually has gone down. Yep. Is, is there a, a, we serve what, eight different towns? Are some better than others in terms of the arrears? No, we have, we actually serve customers in 11 towns, but 11. Yeah, okay. but for example, Elmore, we have, I think, three or four customers, just five maybe. So it's kind of. Eden, we only have one. Yeah, so it's kind of a stretch to say 11, but uh, I don't know that there's any distinction from one to another. Anything else on um, on the COVID arrearages report? If not, I think we turn it over to Sean. 
Perfect. So do we have any other, do you think you have any other questions for Jess or can we cut her loose? Uh, just, just one question on the revenue and, and sales. Um, the night, the variance, residential variance, it only shows, well, actually the, the uh, shows 10,000 for December, 2020, but in the manager's report, um, uh, it said revenues, uh, let's see. Revenues from I, the, where, where I report, I'm talking about all revenues and you're specifying residential revenues, aren't you? Those are two to two residential okay. part of. Yep. Yeah, no, I, that that's, that's right. It still ends okay. up being uh, slightly different. I just want, and I uh, just want to know, I guess that, how did you determine that it was attributable to net metering? I mean, is that a difference in net metering uh, credits from 19, 2019 to 2020, I mean, 2020. So uh, Jess, this is the discussion we had about that variance in the summary. And we concluded that a good portion of it uh, was due to people exercising rec credits out of their banks from energy okay. in the summer, remember? Correct, yep, yep. So that's so. the question. So what is the specific question there? Events. Sorry Are we looking that. at the financials or still the COVID stuff? No, he's in a financial question. Because I, okay. I, I just see. What uh, page are you looking at? What page are you looking at, Vince? Uh, page six on the bottom. I see a difference. Uh, That's not the financials. It's revenue and sales. But oh, it's the, it's the COVID information, though. Yep. Okay. Oh, this is COVID. Okay. So it says so COVID information or financials, it's still revenue and sales for December, correct? I mean, those would be the same. I, I, I guess I, I was just, uh, two things, the total of uh, minus 22 uh, plus 12, that's different, I mean, uh, negative 12 than the, than the 37K under budget. Um, that was in the manager's report. I just wondered what the difference was and how you determine the net metering, but you already answered that. Right. This uh, the the one on the COVID doesn't take into consideration the net metering. That's just what we had for re for re right. residential revenue. Right. Um, so it that, that I didn't minus out any of the credits that I that you would see on on the other report. There's another place in the reports, Vince, that would have the number that you're looking for, and I'm just trying to find where it is. Mike or Jess, if you can point him at it, that would be helpful. Be on page 43. That's the operating revenue right there. Okay. Bear with me. Hold on that one. Hold on a second. Yeah, there's the 37 okay, total 37, operating 37, revenue. Yeah. Okay, got it. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so just so I'm clear, does are you good with that, Vince? We're good. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Hey, Mike. If we're yeah. going to lose Jess, maybe I'll. I was going to yeah. bring. This, I was going to bring it up just from a, a slightly different angle. Um, and I would normally cover it during the general manager's report, but I was going to ask if, as as Jess puts together the budget for 2021, if you could try to make an estimate. I don't think precision is all that critical, but make an estimate of the credits getting pulled out and applied to bills, and try to factor that into the budgeting, because um, it it's um, it's a it's predictable that it'll happen. It may not be precisely predictable because you don't know how much people are going to generate and how much they'll de deplete their credits in each month. But it's going to always be there, right? So, right. is there a way? Is there a way to kind of make, um, based on history or something, make a a provision for it in the budget? Yeah, and what what it'll 
what it'll boil down to is the difference in that each specific person's equation from our not our retail rate but our market pricing right oh, so, right. see what okay. i'm saying so it'll only be the difference because usually energy for us is just a pass through yeah we make a tenth of a penny or something per kilowatt hour but most of it is a pass through so the only difference you're going to see is the loss in the increased kilowatt hour price that we have to give credits for following me yeah yeah i follow you okay so <laughs> when i but i didn't yeah you know, I, I was thinking about it wrong so maybe if you can translate um, what i was thinking which is just let's in a simple practical way try to build it into the budget so it's not a, so it's a lesser variance i understand it yeah. I'm just saying that it's going to be, it's not going to be the full value. It's going to be like seven, uh, eight cents or, you know, what the difference is. And it should gotcha. be on a seasonal basis because it, they're, yeah. they're pulling it out in the months when they're not generating. Right. Is this, I, I looked for it, but I, it's probably there, but uh, it should show up in the financials as a liability, the total number of credits. Uh, Jessica, do, do you? It's in, that sec it's in that section. It's the negative numbers in that section. Okay. Yeah, they're On in page there. 40, 43. So those are what we different the different revenue credits. Okay, got um, it. So they're the existing at that that time that within that correct period created during the billing process at that okay. time. Okay. Yes. Okay. Got it. So it might be worth Jess next meeting if we can plan on doing a little discussion of this number in this data here for all of you means X and this one means Y. Maybe that'll answer some of your perspective there, Roger. Yeah, and for me, it was just so you don't have to next year say, hey, we got a revenue. We're not, we're under budgeted, but it's just this thing. It'd be more like we, we provided for it in the budget. So you'd only be worthy of a comment to the extent it was radically different than what you budgeted, what you assumed. Okay. Okay. Yep. I, I I had two other things before Jess Jess goes, uh, or I have one and one question. Um, Vince, did you have any questions for Jess on the bank statements and the statements at the end that you were going to look at for this month? Uh, I I would I would if that was me, but that was me. <laughs> that was my sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mike, I'm sorry. Sorry. Oh, no, I didn't look at him. <laughs> uh, let me go back to my notes. Yeah, while you're looking for your notes, Vince just signed up for the second month. Okay. I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> quick here. I will not run. Everybody just I know it's going to come around to me eventually, but I'm putting it off. <laughs> the one question I had, the thing that keeps reoccurring is these property taxes, which is substantial. And I'm wondering, how does someone set the property tax that we're paying? Let's so just send us a bill and say, okay, we'll pay it? Or is there a calculation they do? Is Yeah. There's so a the calculation the state gives to the town um, it, for our poles, wires, transformers, number of meters, um, and that takes all of that into <laughs> consideration. Yeah, yeah, miles, miles of single phase line, miles of three phase line, miles of transmission line. It's and all is there a standard. It's based on that we're paying against. Uh, yes, the state of Vermont sends out a letter of you know for a mile of single phase line, the taxes are this. For a mile of transmission line, the taxes okay. are this. For okay. a transformer, the taxes are this. For okay, so joint old but, pole versus fully owned pole. But, uh, but. <laughs> but the key to this process is it's a legislative rule. It's a law on how they have to set that up. So the legislature sets the model. The state uh, tax team processes that model and says, OK, Crassberry, you need to bill Hardwick $2. And OK, Greensboro, you need to bill Hardwick $3. And however that all works out. Jessica and I were on a conference call probably five months ago now, Jess, six months. Yeah, five or six, yeah. Where I was just trying to get a handle on exactly where you are, Mike. How does this, how do you do this? Where right. does this come from? How can you tax us uh, 
this much money on our one customer in Eden, which is costing <laughs> us more than we will ever make, you know, serving the customer. It makes no sense. And they just kept circling back to, well, we're just following the law. We're just following the law. So if you want to change it, you got to fight the law. Is that how you remember it, Jess? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Can we just give them a generator? <laughs> when, we have a, well, it was, when we have a customer like that, um, and we have one customer in Eden, and if we're if it's costing us an awful lot, if it's costing us more in tax to serve the customer right. than what we make from the customer, is there any way to transfer the customer to a utility system? <laughs> Unload them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and and that does happen sometimes uh, if the customer is right on a border between utilities and say we're, we're both abutting a customer between Washington Electric and us, and we both don't want to serve them, then the board rules, the PUC will rule, well, Hardwick, you have a stronger circuit here, uh, so you're going to serve them. Or Hardwick might say, hey, we don't want them, so go ahead and give them to Washington. And they may want to, it's, it's kind of a negotiation in those equations. But our customers at the end of these lines are nowhere near another power line. So we are legally the guy obligated okay. to serve them. And, and, and there, it's not like there's a chunk of line that we would like to give to somebody else. <laughs> no, no, it would be, it would be but, like- you know, Without seeing what the map is, it's hard for me to envision it. Um, well, you're saying it's based on length of line. Who gives them the length of line? Is that something we do? Or they go out and survey it. How, who, who confirms how much line we have or how many transformers? Uh, we provide them the mileage information, do we not, Jess? Yes, we do. We provide yeah, the, we do. all of the information, the active meters, the active transformers, everything. So. Yeah. Okay. I mean, how much money Once are we go, talking about? You do your smart metering and do the GIS stuff, then we'll have, we'll have better counts and everything, so. How much money are we talking about in terms well, wool cut, of wool cut this month was forty two thousand dollars. Okay, but we serve most of wool cut. Right. Yeah. yeah. I'm not saying it's forty two thousand a month. I don't know how many months we pay. I don't know if it's quarterly or annually, but this one's forty two, another one is fourteen. And last month there was one that was forty. So it's it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. I oh, yeah. realize that, but I'm I'm asking specifically about Eden, where we have one customer. No, well, I don't know if Eden was. Eden in this. is uh, eighty five dollars and two cents. Yeah. <laughs> that's per year. Yep. Je yep, just a year. Oh yep. well, that's not worth talking about. No. Um, I thought I thought I thought the comment was being made that we were paying more tax than what we could ever collect from the customer, but that's not the case if it's eighty five dollars hmm. a year. Right, so it's eighty-five dollars, but it but it is legit. So eighty-five dollars, and we make twelve dollars a month off the customer. So if we have one call out on that line, we're losing money. If we have one outage and have to call a crew out, we're in the hole big time. Yeah, of a utility company. <laughs> Just saying, I, it, it is yeah. what it is, but yeah. that's the reality of it. I think that's life with the kind of system we have. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I agree. But, but, the, but the other numbers are are you know reflect our system and and they're I mean, most of the places the towns that we serve we serve most of the town. Yep. Uh, okay. Did right. you have any other questions, Mike? Yeah, two more. There was one that's a wool cut subtran. I'm not sure what that is, but it was twenty four thousand dollars worth of something. That's our the. The loan we have out for the Woka station transformer. Oh, is that a no. monthly fee? What page are you on, Mike? Oh, I don't know. I don't have page numbers on Mike because I printed them out. Uh, do you have a Do you have a check number? Uh, it's like one seventy seven. Oh, that's a vendor number. That's all right. How often is that payment, Jess? Once once a year. Yeah, that's what I thought. Once so yeah, Mike, we bought a we bought a uh, we built a brand new substation in uh, Wolcott about five or six years ago, and one of the things that we replaced in the yard was a 1960s vintage uh, PCB contaminated transformer that was right next to the river, and the unit that that payment that you're looking at was on was for the replacement brand new uh, uh, larger sized 
transformer, which is part of our uh, integrated resource plan to end up with a transformer in Hardwick, as well as a transformer in Wolcott and a circuit between them so that either substation can feed everything. So if we had one transformer fail or the other, we close a couple switches and open a couple switches and everybody's back on. Instead of scrambling and spending 48 hours getting a mobile transformer in place and then pending, spending $15,000 a month to rent it, we'll be avoiding all that. Is this, is this an, a monthly uh, annual lease or is this a lease to purchase? No, we purchased it. You did? So yeah. That's we a time cost and that's it? Uh, so it's going to be, the loan is a one-time loan, but it's, uh, I can't remember how many years it was, but it was a $180,000 transformer. And how many years was the loan? 10-year loan, I think. 10-year loan. Okay. Okay. And transformers usually are, you know, 30 to 40-year life, no problem, so. You'll be retired. <laughs> I hope I'm diving. <laughs> and I have one here, which I guess is our legal fees for a number of different things, but I, the one for Cressbury Academy, which is $4,800. Do we know how much we've spent in total for legal fees for Cressbury? Uh, I would say the vast majority of it is right in that invoice. There might be, okay. uh, yeah, because that's when we were doing all the, all the work with July. Yeah. yeah, I saw yeah. another 1,500, I think. Yeah, there's other things in there, but that one was just for Craftsbury. Okay. Yeah, no, there's another there's another one for Craftsbury also that was fifteen hundred and eight dollars. Okay. Uh, so, so it looks like it's around six thousand. Yeah, that sounds about right. And we're probably gonna have another thousand, maybe two thousand into it before it's over. All right, it's not terrible. All right, that's those are the ones that jumped out to me. Uh, uh, do you know the 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 chargebacks are those <coughs> basically checks bouncing or on the bank statement? Yeah, chargebacks are yeah, a customer pays and their their check is returned for non-payment. Okay, yeah. got it. Fishing funds, stuff like that. Yeah. All right, I'm good. I have the only other thing that I have, and I'm not sure how much of this is for Jess and how much is, it, is for Mike, but I would really like to get the board packet sooner than the Friday before our meeting. Um, I can't speak for others, but. Yeah, and I, I thought, uh, did we discuss getting the agenda at least like uh, maybe a week before? No, we did talk about getting you the reports earlier the packets earlier, but I had an absolutely bananas week and it just was not gonna happen last week, so. <clears throat> do you think we could get the agenda earlier? If there seems to be an interest in that. Sure, we can do oh, that. I'm not sure and how it, much that helps. No, the agenda's pretty broad. Yeah, I know I, we've had a few months there where we were getting it to you by at least Thursday, but I think we had a couple even Wednesdays um, but last week it just wasn't happening. No, I didn't have the financials ready till Friday either with the audit going on. And the real trigger, uh, Lynn, is also getting the uh, VEPSA summary for the for the month. You know, we don't really, we can't do anything till we get that. So it's kind of dependent on which they give us plenty of time to get something by Wednesday. So. Yeah. But well, it's just another factor. Blame it on Sean. You know, if, no, that's, if, no. if, if that's a holdup, that piece could come even later. There's so much other stuff in there um, that it just would be easier if we had it earlier. Okay, so if you don't mind getting stuff piecemeal, that, that makes it real easy. Yeah. I, I wouldn't want every single piece piecemeal, but if there's one piece that, you know, regularly comes a little bit later, I, I don't have a problem with that. I can't speak for other people. Okay. And VEPSA report is pretty, it's, it's a discrete unit and it's pretty big. But anyway, point, point made and heard and accepted that we want to get stuff to you before Friday.
which takes us then to Jess. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jess. Jess. Thanks, Jess. Have a good night, guys. You yep. too. See ya. See ya. Bye. So that takes us to Sean. Buddy. Welcome. <laughs> Mike, if you would give me the uh, ability to share yeah. screens. Yeah. How do I do that again? Uh, I think you <laughs> have to make me. I click on you. And make him a host. Make That'll work. Make him co host. There you go. There you go. <clears throat> All right. So um, let's just confirm things. Can you see a cover slide that says 2021 hardware power supply budgets? Yeah. I think we have all of those. Yeah. Okay. Mine says 2022. Really? No. <laughs> <laughs> all right. My plan for this evening is to present just the first nine or 10 slides, but I included the entirety of the slide deck that was given to the VEPSA Board of Directors if you want to uh, get into a little bit more detail. There is some repetition, so uh, you know, I'm happy to jump around like a uh, your invitation. So Lynn, I specifically asked Sean to include that because I know you like to peruse these things. Yeah. Unfortunately, though, I didn't have a chance to go through it before the meeting so that I could ask intelligent questions because we got it on Friday. Uh, well, what'd we, you do for the last 48 hours? I've had some work to do. <laughs> um, so I thought I'd bring you from the top level down. I'll give you a graphic that's just a bunch of squares and rectangles to show you how the budget is built and then give you an update on November year to date's actuals. Um, the, the VEPSA bill is just being completed this week from December. So uh, that one month lag unfortunately prevented me from giving a look at the year end. And then I'll just take you into what's, what's driving your 2021 budget. Uh, there's four primary things. I'll show you price of energy, price of capacity, renewable energy credits and transmission. And then take a look a few more years out, 22 through 25. And uh, like I said, if you want to take me on a detour anyway through this, I'm happy to do it. So whenever I send the budget out, first thing everybody looks at is total charges. That's right on the front of the spreadsheet. Uh, and it's broken into three pieces. The biggest piece by far is something that was called net resources, load charges and credits. 80% uh, of this is energy, 20% uh, of this is capacity in, in rough amounts. And transmission is the next large item uh, for you that is consists of both Green Mountain Power's transmission charge as well as Ice New England's. And then there's a catch all for administrative and other. As I already mentioned, the the big three are energy capacity, renewable energy credits, followed by transmission, and then admin another. Any questions about structure? I guess I wanna make one point before I move on. This does not include the regulatory expense of, renewable, of the renewable energy standard. That shows up through VEPSA in another place entirely. So. Um, that's different. Is it so, administrative expense? Is that an, is that an administrative expense? Uh, no, the way VEPSA accounts for the renewable energy standard, it's considered a regulatory uh, expense and it doesn't appear here. Uh, the clarification I might offer here since I brought it up was renewable energy credits here is a revenue. It's a good thing. Renewable energy credits, when you look at them for the purposes of regulatory compliance and other parts of the VEPSA budget, that's an expense. So the transmission charges Sean's gonna carry through here include uh, both components of our transmission expenses, including the GMP one that I'm looking to eliminate. Yeah. So, where are we 2020 year to date? This is just a, a screenshot of, of the spreadsheet that gets sent. I've highlighted it in the lower right. Uh, 
the relevant percentages are in yellow. Total costs are actually down a little bit, 2.4% from what we budgeted. Uh, total load is also down a little bit. Um, those two are related, of course. Uh, and the coverage ratio, this is just our label for how close was your supply to your demand. Ideally, you'd like a coverage ratio of 100%. In reality, you never hit that very often. Um, so you're in a very tight plus or minus 2% around 100. So that's uh, excellent. So given what I was hearing Jess describe to you, it seems like you've had a pretty uh, good year net net uh, from a financial perspective, despite the events, <laughs> COVID and otherwise. So um, would you have expected if we had um, um, our if we were in, for example, an area where a large proportion of our customers were related to hospitality, food service ski areas, <clears throat> large manufacturer without operations because of COVID, are, those, are there some people whose mix of customers is putting them in a, in a bad place this year? Yeah, you've mentioned them and I'll call them out by name. It's all yeah. well known, Ludlow has the Okemo Resort, huge drop in load this year. Okemo has not had much operation from a hospitality perspective. All right. three of our college towns, Johnson, oh, yeah. um, Lindenville, and Northfield are down. Lindenville's not much. Lindenville's pretty diverse, actually, but you can see the effect of the colleges in those smaller two towns pretty pronounced. Um, and then the last one I'll... I'll bring up is Orleans, the Ethan Allen Furniture Company shut oh, down okay. for a period of time there. Okay. Um, so that's Ludlow, why we're, we're blessed in this particular year by our mix of customers. Yeah, you know, if you're a bigger diversified utility, you know, Green Mountain Power comes to mind, you know, in general, your residential class went up a few percent. In general, your CNI classes went down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And net net, it wasn't a horrible year. Uh, I certainly had a tough spring. <laughs> the numbers were dramatic back then, but it did level out. We had a hot summer. Um, we made up some retail sales uh, through July and August. I, I wonder how much also occupancy, residential occupancy rose. Mm. Um, occupancy rates, I would think, were, were very high this year. Um, so that people would have been using electricity, just given <clears throat> seem to be any place to rent or buy. Um, yeah, Lynn, to your point, our two smallest systems, Barton and Jacksonville, opposite ends of the state, are almost exclusively residential based, very little CNI base, and their net year to date sales are up, you know, two and three percent. There you go. Okay. That illustrates it. Yeah. Okay. Um, conclusion on the here is this no real rate pressure uh, that I'm seeing unless something happens in December um, should should be a good year from power supply perspective. 2021 I'm characterizing as a return to 2019 levels. This is your 2019 actuals and a bar chart on the left, your 2020 budget, which you're very close to in the middle. And then 2021 is really uh, rebounding to really the same $3.5 million a year level. Um, I'll get into why in just a moment. Um, but the headlines, and I want to be straight with you on this because data can be manipulated. If you just look at 2020's budget and how it rose to 2021, you're seeing 7.1% higher charges. And I know that's a lot higher than anybody would like to see. Um, your load is actually down a little bit the way we forecast it. Um, it's worth pausing a point on here. We have a wonderful load forecaster, a former VEPSA employee named Jared Kaplan. And um, tough year to forecast load. We actually took out all of the data in 2020 because COVID was just an outlier. We really didn't feel like the statistics would work out. So we're modeling you through the end of 2019 <laughs> and stopping because the COVID data caused us problems. So we'll which, see. 
which customers uh, Mike came into our came into our lives in 2020? Who were the new big big users who weren't in 19 but are in 20 and therefore will be in 21? Raspberry Academy. <laughs> Don't bring that up. Okay, give me another one. <laughs> uh, the next, the next let's big not one. Discuss, let's not discuss them now. Yep. Yep. Yeah. No, the next big one will be uh, uh, Jasper Sellers is adding a huge expansion, doubling their load. Uh, it actually wanted to be online by now, but they're a couple of months away. But so they're, they're going to be huh? they're on track. Okay, but they're on track. Okay. Yeah. And other big ones that have come on, uh, the biggest customers, expected customers with the biggest uh, transformer installations in the last probably six months have actually been uh, maple syrup operations with guys going to major RO systems and upgrading their services so they can, they can run those systems. Uh, other than that, it's just been residential stuff, nothing big in the CNI arena. Okay. So that black line, Sean's black line there, that's the all important well, does it work? The, the reason I've been sort of living through this with a number of companies have tried to do 2021 budgets and it's really hard. You, I agree with you, too, the, too many anomalies in 2020, but then 2019 was a long time ago and things have happened. So <laughs> well I've said. Been wondering, yeah. So, so in 2020, the, the total load was actually higher than it was in 2019. Uh, it's awfully flat, Lynn. If I go back a slide. Um, I was just loaded. looking at the black line. Am I misreading this chart? Yeah. No, you're not. It's just that 2020 is representative of your budget, not your actuals. And, and your actuals came in a couple percent lower than this from a load perspective. So it's okay. really, really similar to 19. So, so, so the megawatt hours are this, basically we're assuming no change, 19, 20, 21. Um, and, yeah. What is the black, Mike's comment, but yeah. What is the black line showing us? I think that's the question. Yeah. Oh, load. Where'd you go, yeah. Sean? Well, the reason I hesitate is because metering in Vermont got complicated. Um, it's, it's most analogous to your transformer based load at your system boundaries, your, your substations. Um, so it, it is not reflective of your retail sales. It's not a one-to-one -one thing. Um, it's what your system boundary would measure. Is this because of loss after uh, within the system? How would it be different than the, the total load? Well, total, um, Your, let's walk it up from the bottom, I guess. Uh, retail sales is your smallest number because all of the losses have taken place at that point. Uh, I don't typically see that until months and even after the close of the year. So from a power supply perspective, I don't report retail sales. What I report is um, this total load, including losses, which is the, the load at your system boundaries after Vermont and ISO New England losses have right. been incurred to get there. And if you back up one more level, uh, there's something called ISO settlement load, um, which is used to settle your accounts in ISO markets. How does this all those I'm sorry, Sean, how does this factor in then uh, Woolcott, which is inside our boundary? <laughs> Great question, yeah. So uh, Woolcott is considered a supply source for the purposes of your power budget. Now, you and I both know that it reduces load from the perspective of ISO New England. So that's a fact, but for power budgeting purposes, we treat it as a traditional supply. And um, to get to apples to apples, we have to choose total load, including losses as the relevant number here. I do not choose ISO settlement load because it would distort thanks to the load reducing so, so you're adding the the Wolcott load generation to 
the load at the boundaries. Yeah, that and will also be. You'll do the same thing with 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 H11 when it's perfect. Starting. Yes, Not as perfect. well as your net metering. Yep. So, and they're they're for budgeting purposes. They're going to be es his estimated loads based on historical data, or you know, in the case of H11, it's going to be weather data. Yeah, there's a really nice tool that is public that the National Renewable Energy Lab in Golden, Colorado produces. It gives us a nice hourly shape of any solar project yeah. of any orientation and size at any latitude longitude combination. And, and we use that what? to uh, estimate output. Is, is that are, PV watts? It's PV watts. Yeah. It's great. What are our losses? What, what <laughs> our percent? I got your sheet up here. Let's see if I can find that quickly. Mike, you might know it off the top of your head, but I, uh, yeah, last I checked, it was like 6.8. Seven percent. Is that is that mostly like resistive losses, or how where where are they in the system? Well, we weren't when I got here. We were at fourteen point five percent, so they're oh. half of, they're half of what they used to be with our system upgrades and reconductoring and all the other projects we've done. So we're a lot better than we were a few years ago. So they are line losses. The resistive line losses. They're, they're all losses. You're talking all about losses. the difference between between re, between retail sales and total load. Yeah, it's not just I squared R. You got to factor in the system impedance itself. So it's it's all losses. Well, there's theft too. Yeah, and other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mike, I'm happy to report I'm modeling a number in that range. I've got 6.4%. That's coming out yeah. of the regulatory group. Yeah. And that's going to be dropping. With the, uh, with the, uh, well, actually, the, what's the, the new line, the upgraded line? Is, is that, is that an operation right now? The one that's going to be, have the, uh, Ownership transferred to Hardwick Electric. I'm confused. Ask okay. me your question again. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to <laughs> clarify it to myself before I. I, th I think it's the line that we eliminated. Did we eliminate a high voltage line? No. No? No. We upgraded a bunch of lines recently. Wasn't there a system that was eliminated? Yeah, that, but the, there's a new system in its place that runs more efficiently. Right. Okay. So, Sean, are, are you going to come back to that total cost is 7.1% higher in 2020? Yes, and I can. Okay. Um, I won't ask this. about it. Yeah, I've got a spreadsheet to support the details if you want to go okay. there. Yeah, so. Okay. Um, we'll get there then. Yep. Okay, it was a 3319 line segment, I guess. Okay, I know the line segment you're talking about. What do you want to know? Uh, I, nothing. I mean, that, that's one of the things that was increasing the efficiency of the, of the system. Oh, well, th that's the one that had been upgraded. Is that right? Uh, yes, our section. Our existing section of the 3319 has been totally rebuilt and upgraded, yes. But that section, that's from a strength and integrity perspective, Vince, not an efficiency, because the conductor is the same conductor and the oh, voltage no. is the same level. Okay. You would have to change one or the other of those to improve uh, system, to reduce system losses and improve efficiency. Right. The losses on that line section are not very high at all. I would get, you know, between one and a half and two percent, somewhere in there. Bless you. So let me hit a high level explanation just so we don't have to wait for it as, as the question came. Why are you up 7.1% year over year? Um, the high level answer from my perspective it falls into two categories. First is transmission, the green bar. I'll walk you back to the beginning. 2019, you were still paying uh, Velco related transmission charges for some Lamoille County uh, transmission that was built 15 years ago, Mike, 10 or yep. 15. 
Um, so your transmission dropped from 19 to 20 because the mortgage basically got paid off on those Little Mobile County assets. So the reason the green bar 19 to 20 shrinks is, is that. Um, what's happening to the green bar in 2021? We had a surprise, and I'll show you a picture of that in a moment, in ISO New England transmission rates. They went up by 14% last June uh, as a result of, of lower loads the previous year, uh, I'm talking 19, and continued very high investment um, that I'll show you that trend as well in the uh, transmission rate. So the green bar dropped for a year because local transmission went down, local to Vermont that is, and it's going back up due to regional uh, transmission effects. And uh, so that's one category. The other part of the 7.1% that's kicking in is in the red bar. Um, H11 is roughly a nine cent per kilowatt hour resource. And um, we're not planning to sell those renewable energy credits. We're planning to keep them and retire them in service of your uh, renewable energy standard um, obligations. So there's some growth in power supply costs there as a result of having your first full year of H11. And you're saying to yourself right now, gee, I thought that was gonna save me money. Well, it is, but it's, it's not showing up here. It's gonna show up on your uh, regulatory uh, expenses uh, from BEPSA, which is not an item I have uh, access to or to show you tonight. You've and is it, gonna, is it gonna offset? Yeah, net net, it should be, um, well, let, let me, that's a great question, but let's clarify it. The renewable energy standard increases every single year uh, in tier two. So that is a cost increaser no matter what you do. Um, so as long as you accept that your costs are gonna go up in tier two regardless, there is some offset there. I'm not gonna tell you it's one-to-one -one, though, uh, at least not in the initial year. You have a full year of H11 in there? I do this year, yep. Um, well, no, I don't. It's supposed to come in in March, last I checked. But for the purposes of solar sunlight, that that's a whole year. There's so little production in January and February, even if it was online now. Yeah, but it's not gonna come in in March either, is it, Mike? No, they're, they're about three months behind schedule, Sean. So they're coming in in summer? Yeah, I would say, I would say May, end of May. So make okay. it they'll, one. They'll, yeah, they'll still, two. they'll still get a good, uh, you know, probably seventy percent production year, but it won't be full full bore. So it sounds like it makes sense to start it from June. Hmm? I'd put it June one. Yeah. Just. Yeah. Sorry, I, I that's been a a mover. <laughs> It's not yeah, the only no, it, it's it's it, that's that you know this is this is why this is a process. Yeah, right. And I did tell Sean March, you know, months ago. That's this three month delays just been discussed in the last couple of weeks. Right. Oh, okay. So the time is right. Changes like this are easy for me to make. And uh, if you want me to model a June one or July one. Uh, that will reduce 2021's red bar a little bit. Uh, um, so let's end with the coverage ratio because, um, you know, H11 represents what, six ish, seven ish percent of your portfolio going forward. So your, your coverage ratio is jumping up to reflect that. Um, you're not out of balance by any stretch, but you are a little bit long on energy in these initial years. Uh, due to this addition of the solar project. And the 3% lower load? That's against 2020, Lynn. Um, 2020 budget, I should say. 2020 actuals, boy, it's going to look board flat. Um, oh, that's like 2020 if, budget. That's not 2020 actual. Right. Sorry, I'm not labeled. So, I'm that. sorry. So all of these are against budget, not against actual. Uh, the 2019 is actuals, 2020 and one are budgets. Okay, so when we talk about being higher or lower than 2020, we're talking about the 2020 budget, not 2020 actuals. Yeah, we'll have 2020 I, actuals. That's what I was week. finding confusing because 
So as you redo this, could since you have to anyway for the age mm -hmm. could you substitute for 2020 in the next turn the the actuals? Oh of? yeah, it's I would have given it to you had I had it Great. for tonight. But yeah, the 2020 actuals is my job this week. We'll be sending out the power bills hopefully Wednesday or Thursday. And um, yeah, then it's just a little bit of data analysis to bring it all in. Great. So, but you're just missing December. Yeah, yeah. that's why so I started you, had, you out here. No, so you had through, you had November, through November actuals. actuals. Yep. yep, so we're down a little on down, down a little on cost. Um, so if December turns out to be a an uninteresting month from a budget to actual perspective. Um, your loads will be flat right across 19, 20, 21, uh, plus or minus fractions. And your 7% increase will actually turn into a 9% increase over 2020 actuals if December turns out to be uninteresting. So I'll take you into some interesting stuff. This is the energy price for New England going back to the beginning of the present market structure. It's about 16 years ago, ISO New England implemented the current market design. And I drew a line through it because we're presently at the lowest point on record. <laughs> uh, and that's really forecast to continue. There's no big ups and downs in the forecast window here, remarkably. <laughs> So this is good news with respect to the decision you made last month and last fall. You know, we acquired some energy at this point, so that's good. Um, moving forward to capacity, it's a similar pattern. This is the full history of the capacity market as it was implemented 10 years ago. Uh, you can see we had prices in the mid single digit range for a while. We spiked to $15 a kilowatt month back in 2017 and it's been all downhill since then. Uh, we're presently in 2021, that green bar, uh, kind of at an historical average, but the next two years have already been settled out the way my ISO runs its auctions. So we're gonna continue down uh, for a couple more years. Uh, that's good for companies who uh, need capacity not good for companies who own a lot of generation. They're just gonna get less revenue for providing generation capacity, unfortunately. And in a week, no, two weeks, we will have this 2024 auction. So this forecast bar is gonna get real skinny. Uh, if, if you want me to present to you in a month, we'll have actuals here in 2024 soon. No, it, it, just uh, going back to 3.1, is yeah. that line, is that an RMS line? Uh, I didn't okay. draw a, uh, uh, no, I did not draw a regression line through that. That's just a rough angle. Okay. Uh, and those, just to clarify, the, the, the peaks, are those like demand peaks, uh, spot market, you know, demand peaks? <laughs> I'll uh, give you my interpretation. I, memories aren't perfect, but um, we had uh, very high oil prices coming into the Great Recession. You might remember $100, $140 a barrel oil back here in 07, 08. So this was the spike leading up to the Great Depression here. We dropped. Um, most of these are winter cold snaps. Ice and Wingland doesn't have enough gas pipeline delivery capacity. Right. So uh, I remember that too. Yeah. yeah, we had a paper mill in Maine, got killed on that, yeah. Yeah, so I could go that, back and do a timeline with this, but most of those, to my memory, are... Um, sure, I mean, there, there's actually, just looking at the way this, this varies so much, uh, in short periods of time, this, it, it's, I guess it's a preface to what you're going to introduce later, to basically eliminate those, those peaks through some storage, some DG. Well, those peaks haven't really affected us directly. The one in 15 there that you see, Lynn, I'm sure you remember that. We had a really nasty winter and we, we got dinged uh, January and February, spent some big money because we weren't covered enough. Um, but these other ones since then, we've, we've been fine. 
Uh, and I don't recall anything in 13 either. So I don't know that that one hurt us either. Yeah, the, the thing is, if, if, if we're hedging you every month, and we do, we meet every single month, and we get everybody as close as we can to match supply to demand, you know, these spikes don't affect you much if you keep that close. Um, right, those, those companies that are out there trying to be real-time purchasers and stuff, they're the ones who took it in the shorts on those spikes. All right. My, my, my sense is over the time that, that I've been on the board, which is, I guess, the same time that Mike has been around here, you know, there, there may have been a couple of months where we went over budget, um, but we've generally been trending down, not quickly, yep. but just sort of gradually yeah. So these longer term contracts have eliminated a lot of that uh, mm -hmm. high demand price. Yeah. Yeah. I, the effect of, I mean, at least theoretically, the effect of, of doing the longer term contracts is that we may be paying on average slightly more. Not necessarily, but we may be, but we're not subject to the fluctuations. Correct. Right. Yeah, the rest of New England, all five other states are retail competitive. You get to choose your supplier and oh my goodness, you, you can watch the headlines. They jump around by 20 and 40% a year when this type of stuff happens, retail delivery rates. So uh, Vermont's really unique, you know, not only New England, but Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland, New York, they're all retail competitive. And <laughs> I'm uh, thankful to have worked here most of my career because I'm not bought into the benefits of doing that to customers. Well, it benefits the people who switch. It doesn't benefit the people who <laughs> don't. Yeah, yeah. So we can come back here, I'll, I'll move through um, transmission super interesting. Um, well, we got to go through Rex here first. So renewable energy credits are a close second to energy because it, those numbers bounce around a lot. We're only looking at a very short sign window of only 2021 Rex as defined in Massachusetts for class one. So that particular product has jumped around uh, in 2019, between 25 bucks, 30 bucks, down to 16, it looks like, and then back up into the 30s. Um, as a result, we budgeted last year $25, you know, just drawing lines through this stuff. Things have recently spiked uh, well up over 40 bucks. And so my colleague, Heather Darcy, has been selling forward your McNeil Rex, your Fitchburg Landfill Rex, into these prices so that we can capture those. Um, so that's good news. Your revenue is going to be up. In terms of forecast, though, Massachusetts literally came out this past month uh, with a new regulation that steps down their alternative compliance payment. That is the cost of complying with your renewable portfolio standard if you don't have enough RECs. So it's very administratively clear. They're dropping you down to whatever these lines represent, and every year they're stepping them down. I'm told the politics in Massachusetts are just simple economic development. They're worried about being one of the most expensive places to buy electricity in New England. So they're trying to temper the costs of their own legislation by bringing down their alternative compliance payments. So we, we held a meeting with our colleagues at Burlington Electric. We talked to our uh, renewable energy credit broker who kind of serves as a consultant to us and came to the conclusion that 3250 is a good uh, estimate for what 2021's RECs are going to be worth. So I'm moving you up, but not all the way to present market. Having said that, we've already sold you your RECs forward, most of them, but not all of them into the $40 market we're seeing now. So revenue is gonna be up in 2021 with respect to renewable energy credits. And that brings your overall cost down. Transmission, this is the one I really wanted to, to focus on. So um, between 2011 and this past year, 
on average, prices of transmission grew 6.7%. This is ice in a wingland transmission, not GMP. GMP does a pretty good job of keeping it level. Um, that's two and three times inflation. That's very fast. And yet 2018 and 2019 were lulls in that trend. Very little change in transmission. So the past few years, you've not felt this long-term trend. And then, as I mentioned, in, in June of 2020, we got a 14% pop. The reason you're not seeing 14 here is because it spreads over an odd set of months. It's a, it's a June 1st to May 31st uh, administrative mechanism. So you're going to see 9% this year for sure. You're almost certainly going to see 10% as I budgeted for you in 2021. So that's pretty big. And it's forecast by ICE in New England. This is not my forecast to continue in the seven, six and seven percent range for a few more years. Um, so do you know, uh, Sean, are there, so just so everybody knows, this is all based on, uh, uh, I'm having a brain cramp. What are, what are they called? All, the, all these facilities are joint transmission facilities that are called what? Regional network service? No, that, no. no. Pool uh, facilities. Oh, uh, there's a three-letter thing, but basically, <laughs> it's it's uh, Belco and all these transmission entities throughout New England. Uh, when we build something in Vermont, everybody who's part of ISO pays for it. So if we spend a million dollars in Vermont, Vermont actually only pays a little bit of that million dollars. Everybody else pays most of it. Pool transmission facilities, that's what I'm trying to think of, PTF. <clears throat> so are any specific PTF projects driving these? Because I know there was quite a to-do about Belco spending all kinds of money there from like 17, 18, 19, doing all these projects and everybody else was paying for them. Is there some payback going on now or do they have some legit projects going on elsewhere that are driving those costs or do you know i know in broad strokes mike not in project specifics you know it, it's the it's the boston and southeast area of new england that's causing these upgrades that's where the big money's going um yeah it's 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 southern new england uh, okay with Fair population enough. centers yeah yeah, seen, seen it on the uh, Cape, the, putting up all those big new towers going all the way out from Bourne to P-Town. Yeah, this has been a staple of, Lynn can speak to this probably better than I can, but I, I have not, transmission is just outrageous. There's no competition here. It just goes up and up and up and up. It's like medical costs. <laughs> it's just <laughs> really... It's a tough one to fix and it is, it's expensive. Yeah, there's, there's yet to be, I mean, the system has changed and, and the change hasn't helped. So. Um, so what does this look like over the, the medium term? If we look out over 22, three, four, five, um, the way my budget assumptions presently work is we're going to see another growth year in cost in 2022, and then it'll notch down in 23, 4, 5. Uh, that notch down is the effect of your recent decision. You know, buying Brookfield uh, is cheaper and next era expires at the end of 2022. So um, if things come out as forecast, you'll see another budget that's up. I don't have the percentage memorized for you right now, but if you need it, we can look at the spreadsheet. Then it'll drop down and continue up. The, uh, you know, it's that green bar that's growing. You know, the red one jumps around. That's the volatility of energy capacity markets, but it's it's not trending strongly. Uh, the green bar is what is uh, trending. That's transmission. And load you can see is forecast to grow, uh, not quickly yet. And I say yet because I'm about to do your integrated resource plan. And if if electrification takes off as our policymakers would like it to, the back half of the decade could see some load growth, uh, but that's not showing up in these numbers yet. It takes some time to build that momentum.
there we go. So total costs about 2% a year. Net resources isn't really going anywhere. Fraction transmission is growing at that trend I showed you a couple slides ago. 5.6 is forecast. And then your coverage ratio, um, you know, it, it just popped up from like 98% to 105, thanks to H11. It's going to drop back down in um, July of 23. We have um, some market contracts that are going to drop off from EDF trading uh, as a decision you made maybe a year, year and a half ago at this point. So we'll have to uh, do a little more hedging. And the 2021 plan purchase, I mentioned it last month, we mentioned it here again. Uh, we'll step into some of those volumes, hopefully quickly here. Yeah, what's the status of those, Sean? How close are we to hearing about something on those at, at the board level? Uh, I don't have a clear answer for you, Mike. I have, uh, you know, I guess I'll, I'll take it to Ken tomorrow. We have our staff meeting tomorrow morning. If, if you want to push it, it could be put on the February agenda at this point. I've got time. So oh, no, I'm not, I'm just curious. I didn't know where you guys were at with it. That's all. Yeah, I don't, I haven't turned the, the numbers yet. Um, trying to just okay. close out 2020. Okay. Thank you. So the, this last bullet I, I'm giving to you kind of cold. Uh, I left the board, BEPSA board last, well, was last week, two weeks ago with a series of cost saving actions. What do you do about transmission costs uh, when they grow like this? Well, there's really three primary answers. You have to get your peak down either with demand response, with storage or with energy efficiency or some combination of the three. Um, if you didn't already know, we're in the midst of a storage RFP. It was issued last fall. Uh, we've got nine responses. We winnowed it down to four semifinalists and we'll be putting them through a multi-month process uh, going forward to purchase um, utility scale storage. That means megawatts, not kilowatts. And it's really the reason I'm halting here because I just don't know how it's going to come out. We've gotten some incredibly compet price competitive proposals, but they are um, not without risk. And the rules around peak shaving are shifting in New England right now. Um, ISO has made some filings with FERC that kind of shine a spotlight on our load reducing efforts and they've raised the specter of reconstituting load, which is a fancy word for adding all those load reducers back to your peak. So the evaluation of the storage RFP is gonna be really interesting. I'm very happy with the process to date, but I, I can't see through to the end point to give you a, a confident conclusion. I'm not so sure we're building. Something where, where if, if it were to go forward, we would take a piece of it, is that, is it? Possibly like, like on some yeah. of the generation. What what kind of technologies are being used, and what are the environmental costs of it? This group of bidders almost exclusively bid lithium ion and, and related chemistries, so pretty standard commoditized batteries. Um, they bid them in the one to four or five megawatt range with respect to capacity. And they bid them in a two to four hour range in terms of duration, in terms of energy. So those are the systems we're looking at. Two to four hour duration and capacities in the one to five megawatt range. All lithium ion. So if and when that comes to fruition or a proposal looks like something VEPSA would want to move forward with, then they would seek interest from the members, Lynn. So we're not part yeah, of any- no, that's what, Yeah, that's what I was asking, if this was like the way, the process that we've gone through on generation. Yeah, it's a, got an even closer analogy though. In 2017, this is prior to my tenure, of course, VEPSA ran a solar RFP that resulted in our relationship with Encore Renewables. So- we're trying to do the exact same thing. We want a development partner. We don't just want a single project. We'd like to have multiple projects stepping into over a series of years. So um, 
Encore is one of our semifinalists. It could be a continuation of that relationship, in which case they do some site development, ideally adjacent to a substation. That's the ideal location for this stuff. Um, but there's several other uh, very competitive companies. NextEra, interestingly, is one of them. Um, local company here in Vermont called Green Peak Solar. A couple of colleagues of mine live down in Waitsfield area. They've built some batteries for GMP at a very competitive cost recently. Um, trying to remember the fourth company escapes me, but anyhow. Um, uh, so, sorry, I, I had to step out <laughs> for a couple minutes, but uh, getting to that, uh, it sounds like uh, as far as storage goes for peak shaving, you're talking about larger uh, storage facilities, or you talk uh, rather than, you know, I know they're like GMP and uh, um, Eversource have uh, they, they'll actually they have they'll have contracts with um, people that have storage, e either cars or uh, batteries, or and uh, they'll draw on those batteries under certain conditions, you know. And then in the case of uh, EverSource, they don't they they're very specific about not um, if they have an upcoming like weather event or something, uh, they'll. They won't. Uh, they won't draw from the, the people's battery. Whoever the customer's battery is, so that the customer still has it available. But anyway, I guess what I'm saying is that it's it's a distributed rather than um, a more distributed storage rather than a large, um, you know, large capacity storage. I, I mean, I, I think they're both important, but I think that as the uh, electrification continues and uh, as I think more storage uh, uh, develops like uh, local storage uh, having that kind of smart ability to draw uh, from uh, this distributed storage is important too I don't know do you guys are you developing anything like that uh, I know GMP has it uh, they're a little more restrictive than Eversource but you know they're doing it specifically to for peak shape yeah, they've, they've marketed that as a BYOD, bring your own device kind of program. Uh, we are not there to my knowledge at VEPSA. Um, and there's a, there's a very basic underlying reason. You have to have a software platform built to manage that uh, distributed right. energy resource management system. And um, yeah, putting that kind of upfront investment and in, in something that may or may not go to scale near term is speculative. Um, GMP's obviously taken the leap, but um I'm not aware of any plans at VEPSA to put that kind of platform in to manage a set of distributed resources yet. AMI is a step in that direction, of course, um, but that's uh, that's also in development. To, to, what are we talking about roughly in terms of a cost per megawatt to say for for storage versus? Uh, a cost per megawatt of transmission. <laughs> Great question. You know, you know I'm, I'm, I'm just yeah. wondering, you know, and that, that leaves aside the environmental issues with lithium ion batteries, because they are, in my view, huge. Um, but. Um, so I'll give you two answers that I think will keep me out of trouble with executive session issues. Um, Green Mountain Power recently signed an energy storage service agreement it's equivalent to a PPA. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it was filed with the regulators. So the, the number, I can't remember exactly, Lynn, but it was in the that's order. Okay, of six, that's okay. I'm looking for ballpark, not. Yeah, ballpark. It was $6 a kilowatt month. Very specific product, though. So $6 a kilowatt month compares to a regional network service cost of 12, 14. Yeah. Look at this right hand axis over here. That's your cost of RNS. Right now, it's just over 10 bucks, and it's going to grow into the 12 and 14 per dollar per kilowatt month range. So GMP just bought peak shaving for this $6 number here. Okay. But it was a very highly structured thing, both with respect to finance and also respect to energy, because GMP gets that battery for 100 hours a year and 100 hours only for that $6. And the other 8,660 hours a year, the developer of the battery gets it 
and they are basically selling it into the frequency regulation market in New England to make up the difference in the, the real full cost of the battery. Um, so, you know, ballpark, you know, our RFP, you know, when you, I've saw numbers as high as 20, $25 a kilowatt month for smaller scale batteries uh, when we owned everything. And the six bucks that we saw from GMP is, is the floor, just a huge range. And the primary difference isn't financial games. It's, it's how you view the value of frequency regulation uh, in the future. So the, <clears throat> the technology that I'm interested in, Lynn and others, for, for us perhaps to couple with the H11 in the next few years, is a stored air system. Um, there's a couple companies out there now. One of them makes a, a, you know, a shipping container, comes in on a truck, they drop it off, and it's a one megawatt unit that I think runs for three hours on the air that it stores. And the whole container hooked up, ready to go, is about 750 grand, which is pretty, not too bad, I don't think, but. For a megawatt uh, for three hours. Right. And what's the reach? And then you recharge it off peak. Right. Yeah. So it, it's, it's not costing much at all to recharge it. You got it. So it's like pump storage. It's similar, but pump storage is more efficient. Well. Well, I can imagine if we wanted to build a tower. <laughs> Yeah, good luck. <laughs> we'll do it on Buffalo Mountain. Right. <laughs> going to clear the woods first. Yeah. Well, he wants to clear the woods. Oh, God. Let's not even go there. Yeah, let's not go there. Um, Local joke, Sean. It, it um, yeah, well, I think we'll have to see what, what happens with, 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 uh, as your project advances. Yeah. Um, but I think there are other things and I, I have been wondering whether there aren't other ways that we could, we don't have the communication stuff to do controlled um, peak shaving, right? And we, we yeah. don't have, we don't have, we don't have something where we can do a, 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 a water heater disconnect no. for example no. or a water heater ac disconnect which was a program that i worked on <laughs> oh my god um rolling blackouts 40 years 40 years ago no this wasn't rolling blackouts this was this no, was no, about that, that, I, I, it, yeah no. rolling blackouts were a non-starter um, yeah <laughs> um but no i mean the, the you know there was technology 40 years ago where you could hook up you could put a device on central air conditioning and a water heater so they both didn't run at the same time um now we don't have a big air con central air conditioning load in our service territory but we have some you know the, I don't, you know, I just wonder what's out there. What, what's sort of the low hanging fruit that we're not tapping into from an efficiency standpoint? Are um, we trying to, is it a summer or a winter peak or is it a monthly peak we're trying to reduce? Is it every a month? monthly peak it, for transmission. For transmission, okay. And is it higher in the summer than the winter, our transmission costs? Our peak is on the coldest day of the winter on Sunday night. At about seven o'clock. There you go. <laughs> but the but the monthly peaks. I think Sean has had a chart that had the monthly peaks. Yeah, let me switch these around. Sean's got it all. You just got to wait for him to pull it up. Yep. Yeah. So nine point six action item one. And what, what, what is the, the additional cost if we're able to eliminate the, those, those peaks? I mean, how much, would say, how much savings would there be if we could eliminate the peaks through some method? Do you have like a number? Oh yeah, you know, it's, you, you can avoid $10 a kilowatt month every month for every megawatt you reduce peak and that's gonna grow to 14 very quickly over the next five years. 
Okay, um, and do you have like a just a ballpark annual savings? Depends how much you shave. Yeah, if I unitize it, what's your peak, Mike? Five megawatts, something like that? Uh, still over six. Okay, but I'll, I'll just take one megawatt times 10 times. Yeah, it's 10,000 a month per megawatt today. I, so I, what does that end up being? Fine at the end of the year. That's not well, if you succeeded every single month, uh, it would be 10 times, 12 times that. So if you- Okay, so $20,000. $20, yeah. All right, but the key is hitting it. It's not easy. But I, I, wonder, I wonder, you know, and I, I don't know, I haven't looked at the efficiencies of, of it, but for example, with heat pump water heaters, if people were converting a resistance water heater to a heat pump water heater and the heat pump water heaters even allow you to program when when they're running and you can do it with a remote control even uh you don't have to go down into your basement to do it um whether when people are replacing their electric resistance water heater we don't get any savings if, if if they're doing what I did, which is replace a, a, a an oil water heater with a with a, a with a heat pump. But if but, someone's replacing a resistance water heater with a with a heat pump water heater, Lynn, I love 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 your thought. If I take off my power supply hat and pretend I'm working back at Efficiency Vermont um, for a moment, you know that. <laughs> traditional electric resistance water heaters draw on 4kw average when it's on and it's heat pump water heater equivalent even if it's utterly uncontrolled it's not going to pull more than 1kw just by nature of what it is yeah, but on the on the coldest winter day when your heat pump is on your hot water heat pump is on your basement is cold it goes to straight electric heat you're almost back where you are on the worst day if you're it putting it in that degrees, mode, that's it, true. If it gets below 55 degrees in your basement, it goes to straight electric heat because there is no heat pump. Otherwise, but you your freeze your pipes. Your basement is, isn't going below 55 degrees. Well, you'd be surprised if you put a hot water heater in. It's a heat pump. I, I have a hot water heater in my basement. My basement, I doubt that my basement's below 55 degrees. But as it it's gets pretty, colder, it's pretty constant temperature year round. But there are, there are things to do to limit operation of appliances the only problem is why would someone do it if they're, they're not getting a a charge for peak demand there's no incentive for them well no there is an incentive if you give them a credit on their bill it doesn't have ah. to necessarily this is where i mean you, there are there have been programs again there have been programs it used to be called demand side management um and there have been programs since 1980 um i i think or thereabouts. Maybe it was seventy nine. Maybe it was eighty one. But right around then, um, I mean, there, there was there was legislation in Congress on it, um, and yeah. When I was I, at CVPS, we had a hot water. Uh, well, the first thing we would need is a tariff, a rate tariff, to do this under. But we had a rate tariff at CV where you could lease a hot water heater, and it was a big one, it's like an 80 gallon water heater, I think for seven bucks a month. And you could get on this rate where we controlled the hours that your water heater was on, and it was such a big water heater to carry you through the day. Um, and it was like, you know, 30% reduced uh, kilowatt hour pricing because we could control that and only let it make heat and make it hot water when it was non-peak hours. But the first thing is to develop the rate and justify your how you calculated that rate before you could do the program. Yeah, no, there's a lot, I'm not, I'm not minimizing the work that would need to be done. I'm just suggesting that there are things that we haven't right. looked at that I'm not aware, at least to my knowledge that we haven't looked at, um, that, that could reduce our peak and frankly could be perceived as a good service to our customers. 
Yeah, I agree. Um, and so I, 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 I just wonder, you know, so, we so don't what have is staff obviously to do the research and, and stuff on that. I don't know if EPSA is looking at any of those kinds of programs for, you know, little guys like us. Um, but it, it strikes me that, um, that that's potentially beneficial and, and maybe more beneficial than going to storage with the kind of storage options we have now. It can be. Uh, like I said, I'm, a, I'm an advocate for this stuff. And Mike, CVPS, as it was absorbed by GMP, continues to run that program. Yeah, there's several tens of thousands of customers on that rate you described. You know, if, if we were going to own equipment, we, we can borrow, first of all, interest rates now are low for everybody, but we can borrow at a lower rate than our customers can borrow at. Um, I, I don't, you know, it just, it, it seems to me, I don't know what the best way to look into it is, but given what's happening to transmission, I mean, transmission costs are about a third of our costs. Yep. And if they're going up at five, 6% a year, that means our costs, everything else being equal, nothing else going up are going up 2% a year, which is the number that Sean had on his thing. So I, I um, it's clearly the thing we have to decide as a, as a board that we want to work on as a long-term initiative. We're interested in all possible solutions and maybe address it with multiple solutions. Right. Yeah. Another solution that offers some good, uh, uh, another good solution to peak shaving is working out agreements. For example, Jasper Sellers is putting in a massive generator uh, at their facility, and you know they're going to be over a 200 kW customer. Where if we know we're going to peak in the next three hours, we can call them up and say, "Hey, we're off uh, executing OP10 or whatever we come up with." So you need to shed your load within the next 15 minutes. They fire up their generator for three hours and we give them some money for us yep. saving yeah. X on the peak. Yeah, yeah I, I've been part of programs like that. That's good. That, and they yeah. work. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I designed interruptible rates 40 years mm -hmm. ago. Yeah, they're, they're good you know, they're, for everybody. They, they're win-wins. Yeah. Well, they're win-wins when they have a generator. I've, I've had plants where we signed up where we didn't. And it's a little bit of pain, and you're kind of gambling. Just, well, it also depends on your production process. If you, you know, <laughs> if you have one that uh, can't be interrupted, it's not a good thing. I'm not talking about forcing customers onto it, but if, if, yeah. if as, but the as, case, as, as, boy, as what Mike, right. what, what Mike described there is ideal, where the customers yeah. made an investment in the generation on their own. Uh, I, I think what you're saying, uh, Roger, being a long-term plan, I mean, is. It's great, and I think, like, I'm really interested in it. And you know, it, the components necessary, the components you can, or the uh, solutions you can use in order to stabilize the demand would be either in consumption or in buffering it with with some internal generation storage, or you know, uh, so. Uh, the the generation that's a lot that's more a technical issue, and the consumption, you know, you're trying to change behavior unless you can build in some technical things like uh, remotely being able to modulate somebody's heater, electrical heaters. But uh, having the storage, having some storage, you know, like you're talking. I mean, d does anybody want to? Uh, 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 work on that. I mean, as far as board goes, board members go. Uh, I mean, I, I'd be what happy to work. On, what do you mean work on it, Vince? Yeah, I think, I, mean, I think Mike should work on it. We should review it. And Sean will work on the his side of it. And we should review it every month. I'm not sure, but but I'm open. It doesn't seem to me 
something we should be working on. It seems like something we should be reviewing and discussing. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I, I, I guess that's here. Sorry to interrupt. I, I recall my break, colleague break. Heather having done some analysis on the topic within the past year. She's got an efficiency background. So um, I'd love to create an opportunity for her to, to present it to you. Uh, that would be great. You know, I'll have to see where, where it stands and where Ken Nolan's thinking is. But yeah, NEPSA should be able to give you some level setting piece of information around cost and technology right now. Uh, and, 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 you know, Vince, maybe another way to look at it is we're just one member of EPSA, but I doubt that all the other members, they might have, if they're in Ludlow, they're probably worried about other things right now, but everybody will come around to the same set of concerns we've been expressing each on their own schedule. So maybe the message that goes back to BEPS is, you know, what are we going to do to up our game to address the challenge? You know, one of the things we say is, gee, we're small. We can't afford to have the communication software. We can't do this. We can't do that. Well, maybe through our membership of BEPSA, we can evaluate, you know, how we're gonna navigate those obstacles that come with our small scale. Because it seems like the world we're going into in the coming years, we're not gonna be able to hide behind that. Exactly. For all and, that and, long, you know, I mean, how, yeah. Say, so, well, we, we, yeah. Cause the world is just going that way, you know? And, you know, I was, you know, just being in business always considered challenges, opportunities rather than obstacles. And, you know, they're interesting and they're, you know, they eventually submit to uh, uh, creative problem solving. Well, I think Mike, if you, the, this, this air storage that you were talking about, I, I think it would be interesting to see what the yeah. cost of that, is. I mean, you talked about it being what, $765 for the, the unit. Um, wow. Thousand dollars for the unit. Sorry, um, I, I was converting to kilowatt, so I was coming up with seven sixty five for a kilowatt. But um, what that comes out to as a, as a monthly cost over some lifespan of, of of the unit and figuring in whatever maintenance costs and whatnot there are, um, because that would give us. One, yeah, so, one tool. you know, a frame yeah. of reference, and maybe that's something we should be doing sooner rather than later. Yeah, Sean, who was it that you you said you were going to on the VEPS end? Well, the, the, I know my colleague Heather has turned some numbers on heat pump water heaters, which includes a demand response component. Um, so she's got something from this past year. Uh, okay. But that's that's a different animal. I, I'd be happy to get some stuff and present uh, it to all of you on that stored air system. That'd be great. And then Vince, where I where I made the comment about us not working on it, I think, it, and and I'll just offer up a viewpoint. I think it's really good that all of us be bringing to these meetings ideas, you know, things. If, so if you. If you're hearing about stuff, Vince, that's great. Let's let's ask the question of Mike and John. Does this, you know, should we pursue this? Should we investigate that? Absolutely. What are all the, you know, it's sort of like what's the menu of of things you can do to address this issue, which right. are more difficult, less difficult for us to get access to and actually implement. And don't and and instead of looking at it as just what well, what are we going to do for next year, two years, or three years, try to try to view it as a decade long challenge. What are the things we could do short term, medium term, long term? Yeah, I mean, I, I I think it's you know personally, I think it's important to be you know not just a good utility that provides good service and, and uh, product to. The consumer, but also be part of a uh, a long-term energy solution. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, an interesting thought as I listen to it, you know, and, and I don't know exactly what you're doing at home, Vince, but I think it is reflective. Our area, Mike, it seems like your customer base did kind of go pretty enthusiastically into net metering, maybe more. Oh, we, yeah, we are by far and away the <laughs> most participation yeah. uh, per capita in our, in our customer base by like so 35 by like yeah. 35%, yeah. So the people who fit that profile may well be a certain percentage of them would probably be eager to do battery systems and the battery systems, you know, if it, if it could link into solving this problem as well, maybe, you know. Yeah, put it this, I, way, my person, put it this my way, your person. phone's gonna keep ringing. People are gonna say, what about it? What about it? How's it work? Yeah. My personal opinion on the battery thing is that I have the same environmental concerns that Lynn is hinting about, but I really have concern over depending on Joe customer maintaining his system and us yeah. depending on that system next year to do what it's supposed to do. That doesn't interest me at all. If we were yeah. going to do something, I want to be in control of it. No, I definitely he hear your concerns, but uh, these systems do exist and they right. function. And, and yeah, I know fact, they do, but I don't like fact, them. <laughs> Right. Well, I mean, you know, okay, you're personal. <laughs> I, I understand that, you know, and you can't, uh, you know, one, uh, like I said, they do exist and they, they exist for a reason. And the uh, financial people at, say, for example, Eversource, um, they use them because they work. And uh, but in any case, it would require, as Sean was saying, uh, some kind of platform or some some method for hydroelectric to be able to remotely draw from batteries. You know, it would require some kind of it's you know it's a technical problem that may require a substantial software investment too. Uh, substantial hardware investment too. Um, I don't, it wouldn't really require any hardware investment except for the homeowner, whoever was installing the battery. I mean, it's, it's just, it, you know, it just goes through the, you know, through the, uh, through your, uh, uh, your uh, main panel. That's the electrical component, but you still need the control systems and the control yeah. components too. Anyway, um, I think we're kind of going onward. To I think we should continue. Saving the world. <laughs> My part, I gave you the slides that I had planned to give you. There are more, of course. I'm showing you one here, but uh, I think that was my last slide. So I think I think the the takeaways I think are I mean for me this this you know this made sense, um, but in terms of is to get the year end data see if that's showing anything and also to adjust H11 to, to uh, starting in June. I yeah, so if there, if there we'll, were other uh, get to work on a budget update with uh, June 1. Is that the? Yeah. Thing? Okay. But the, the assumptions that you had made, you know, look reasonable to me at any rate. And, and am I correct? I mean, my takeaway from all this preliminary stuff is that we don't appear to be going into 2021 with um, with a with a rate problem. That we're no, all we, look, we look good. We look good. Yeah. The budget may be better. Maybe you know we'll see what it actually. But it's not going to be anything that's going to challenge and put us at the place where we're we're not tenable. Correct. Great. Well, that's an accomplishment. That's good. And if, if something drastic were to change where we got into a situation, because we're a muni, we can put in a proposal for rate, you know, rate increase subject to refund. We don't have to do what GMP does, which is get the rate approved before they can put it into effect. Yeah, but gosh, I don't know about everybody else. I mean, I, I think our, our, our key goal is to on our watch, not have to do that, right? Oh, listen, uh, I-, I Number done one great. priority. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I think I think we're all on the same page on that. I was yeah. that was just an aside note for people who might not have been aware that. 
Yeah, I'm actually, that'd be interesting. I'm not aware of the, the whole process and procedures, partly because I don't want to be, but <laughs> good to know. Does anyone have any other questions for Sean? Thank you, Sean. Excellent as usual. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, Sean. I'll be in touch, Mike, with uh, more revised budget and we'll, okay. Have a good evening, Sounds everybody. Good. All right. Thanks, Sean. Still right. feel like I'm at risk of shutting you all down. Let me get this. Oh, one. yeah, Mike, you should unhost him. Yeah, he has to do it. Oh, he has, he has to, to do it? Be the host, yeah. There, Mike, you should have it back. Okay. All right, good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good night, Sean. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is the general manager's report. Is there, are there any questions? I, I, had, I had oh, one sorry. question about the article that was in the, in the um, Caledonian record, which on the whole I thought was okay. But there, there was a comment that Hardwick Electric initially sought $200,000. Yeah, which maybe that was an early estimate, but I didn't think we ever asked for it. We never did. The only time two hundred thousand dollars was ever mentioned was the first time that I was up there doing my testing. Suspicious, hadn't gathered all the data yet, and Mr. Bjerke came outside to chit chat, and I informed him there was a problem and that it might be a number as high as $200,000 that was underbilled. I never said I had done my homework. I said, it's a possibility it could be that high, but I will do my testing. I will provide a full written report and I will give you an accurate number for you and your school board and your principal to peruse. And I'll be glad to present on that for you. And uh, he took that number as gospel and that's where it originated and that's where it keeps coming back from. My, 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 my sense, um, unless Eli were to say differently, is that we shouldn't say anything. You know, we shouldn't, there shouldn't be a letter to the editor at this point or something. No. But, but I wonder once this is settled, um, I don't know whether it's worth commenting on but it, that, that just sort of jumped out at me when I saw it in, in the in the and I wanted to make sure that that was not accurate yeah and I I did get that all clarified in my pre-filed testimony with the commission so they're aware of it uh, okay. if not the Caledonian reporter <clears throat> okay any other questions comments about the manager uh, is a Air blast system, is that to clean the sluice way or is that? Yeah, so what uh, what we have right now, Vince, because you haven't had your field trip yet, I figure we'll do it when it's warmer. Um, in the gatehouse, where the water comes into the actual uh, pen stocks, there's a trash rack system, which keeps the trash, the rocks, the logs, leaves, stuff from going down the turbine, damaging it, plugging it up, whatever. And we have a rake system on a cable that goes down, flips the rakes, and it pulls all that stuff back up so we can get it out and dispose of it. The other part that's down in there is, has been uh, 45 feet of the 50 feet of depth of silt and sand, plugging the whole thing up. So you have four feet of water trying to feed two six foot tubes, doesn't work. So, uh, what we've been doing since I got here to combat that, rather than spending $18,000 a week, I think it was, to dredge, uh, we built a little system to hook up to our behind the truck air compressor and actually blow that silt and just, it looks like a big uh, bubbling cauldron and we just stir it up and flush it down through the tub turbine and we have 30 feet of clear water in there at all times. Um, 
but once we get the divers in there, they're gonna do an airlift system on the penstock side of the racks because there's some silt in there that we can't get to. And once they get down to the foundation, the concrete, they'll put a, a pipe system that we can just hook up the compressor, blast the, the pipe system from the very bottom and it'll do the whole 50 feet of the trash racks rather than the 30 feet we can reach now. And yeah. that, that will alleviate just any water flow problems we have. It's a very inexpensive uh, system. Uh, and the install of it is like literally a day or two. So it's not a big deal. Yeah, great. Uh, any yeah, even, about with, even with the diving expense, I think it was like $21,000 and it's a done deal. So right. it's, a, it's a excellent. We use them at CV on all the hydros. How, how does uh, any abrasion on the on the turbine blades from the silt? No. Emulsified silt now. No, that's we evaluate the blades uh, every year for that. And when the unit was last rebuilt, uh, the blades were actually replaced with stainless steel blades. So they're yeah. harder and uh, the silt really doesn't affect them. They're, they're probably not that, I mean, what, what just out of curiosity, what, what are the RPMs of uh, the blades? The unit, uh, when it's running at synchronous speed, it's going 514 RPMs. Okay, so we're not talking real, real fast. That, that's fast for a turbine. <laughs> yeah, but you know, for like abrasion issues. Oh yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Has, has the timber situation with Encore been resolved? Uh, not entirely. Is that something that we need to be in executive session to discuss or? No, I don't think so, no. Uh, so basically I sent them an email the other day just saying, hey, you know, I don't wanna get into a big to-do about this. All I want is the rate payers to be made whole on their timber that's gonna be removed from their property. And HED never agreed to give that to you. HED never agreed to donate that to your costs for your tree removal project. And we want that money. And that's how I left it. And I haven't got a response. I think that was Friday afternoon. So I know their attorney contacted Eli. They have a good relationship. And Eli is totally on the same page with me. I included him in all my thought process and emails. And uh, so he was welcome. Uh, had my approval to speak to this guy and try and work it out to the best of HED's interest. And I'll probably hear from him in the next day or two. Eli's main thing was because of the right of way clearing that we did, that was in excess of what Encore committed us for, which they never should have done. He said, don't, you know, for a few thousand dollars, why do you want to put yourself at risk where they're going to want you to write a contract? And if anything goes wrong, you're the one who's going to be paying the 248 fines or the ANR fines or having to deal with the ANR. He said, five or $10,000, why would you want to do that? And I said, you're absolutely right. I don't want to do that. But I do want the money for the timber. And that should be a simple, that should be really simple. So hopefully it will be. Presumably, Eli's not going to spend a lot of time on this. No, no, no given no. the amount that's there. I mean, one possibility from a relationship standpoint, even, is just to to share the. Well, the, the issue part. was here's the issue, Lynn. I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. So the no, issue was fair. he uh, Encore was going to pay a logging company uh, twelve thousand dollars to clear this six acres of land and give them all the timber. Well, that's I, Yeah, I said, what are you doing? That is, <laughs> no, they pay, the logger pays you to take timber. You don't give him money. So I said, well, I'll tell you what, if that's what you're gonna do, you can pay Hardwick Electric the $12,000 and I'll take care of the logger. And he said, okay, that sounds good. So I had a logging guy I know who I've done business with many times over the years. He came over and said, oh, yeah, you got five, six thousand dollars uh, worth of timber in here. Easy. Um, 
And uh, he was ready to start like the next day, bring all his equipment. And he said it was a three day project to clean the six acres. And uh, that's when Eli got involved and said, no, they, they were proposing a contract that was going to make us responsible for the guys in the, in the excavator wearing a COVID mask. I mean, it was ridiculous. So we refused to deal with it. Okay. Anybody have anything else in there on the manager's report? If not, is there any new business that we need to discuss? Because if not, I would suggest that we go into executive session to discuss. Uh, I'll make a motion. I'm, it is uh, 6.59 p.m. I move that we go into uh, executive session to discuss a confidential customer matter. So move, second, whatever. We are in executive session at 6.59. Okay, we're, we're, we're out of, yeah, we're recording. We're out of executive session at 7.15. I move that we go into executive session to discuss a litigation matter, the premature disclosure of which may prejudice the interests of Hardwick Electric Department and its customers. Oh, very good. Is there a second? And we, and we had no action taken from the first session. Thank you. Did we have a second? Second. second. Okay. Okay. Got off again. It is 7.20 p.m. Uh, we are out of executive session and no action was taken. And we went in at 7.15. 7.15. Yep. Well, whatever. Whatever your thing says, Mike, is fine. Yep. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. Any opposition? <laughs> Hearing none, we are adjourned at 7.20 p.m. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you thank all. You. And Good day, guys. Adios. You too. May it be a better year than 2021. I mean, the 2020. God, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs>